Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dual Perspectives on Cutting Edge Recruiting and Talent Development Strategies. My name is Ethan Buckelwick. I'm the Content Manager here at CampusTap. Um, we are really excited to be hosting this webinar today. We have a great panel. Um, we have Sarah Greenwell from Bullhorn. We have Maura Quinn from Liberty Mutual. Both of them will be providing some perspectives on the HR, talent, and recruiting side, and then from the higher ed side, uh, as we have dual perspectives, we have Maria Stein from Northeastern University. Um, we'll get into some <coughs> introductions to all of them in just a moment, um, but do want to just let everyone know that you know we're going to try to keep the conversation today to about 40, 45 minutes, and then open up um, for some Q&A at the end. So feel free if you have questions throughout the um, throughout the webinar to provide those on the, the right hand side in the live chat and we'll kind of be monitoring those and um, when we get to the Q&A section we'll kind of bring those up um, as we go along. So without further ado I'm just going to do a quick screen share here to do some introductions with our wonderful panelists. So bear with me there as I open that up. All right, so here we have a quick agenda just to go over introductions. Uh, we will be touching on the state of talent and retention. Then we'll talk about the skills gap, especially relating to you know, the fact that there are a number of technical jobs added into the market now. Uh, and then we'll go into experiential learning, internships and co-op programs, uh, the benefits there and how to really best kind of format those and, and set those up so students are having a lot of success. Um, and then from there, we'll kind of close out talking about mutually beneficial employer partnerships, and we have obviously both sides of the spectrum covered there um, in our Q&A. So without further ado, let's formally introduce our panelists. First off, we have Maura Quinn, who is the Director of Undergraduate Recruiting at Liberty Mutual. Um, she's responsible for designing and implementing innovative recruiting initiatives across undergraduate talent acquisition. Uh, as an advocate for relationship recruiting, Maura was responsible for creating and implementing such initiatives as the Countrywide Undergraduate Internship Program, the Liberty Mutual Insurance Leadership Forum, and the Right Fit online game for students to learn more about the type of positions they should pursue at Liberty Mutual based on their background and interests. She currently serves on the Council for Women of Boston College and the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Um, that's kind of how we were first introduced to Maura, and we really enjoyed working with her so far. Uh, and next up, we have Sarah Greenwell, who is the Director of Talent Acquisition at Bullhorn, a local um, Boston-based company here. Uh, Sarah, <clears throat> with, a decade, with a decade of corporate recruitment experience in various industries, including high technology, she leads a team of recruiters dedicated to filling the organization's entry to executive level openings globally. Uh, her expertise lies within creative sourcing, technical recruitment, and employer branding. Uh, she holds a master's in leadership from Albertus Magnus College and an AIRS certified internet recruiter certification. And we'll let everybody speak to a little bit more about what they do after we introduce our final panelists here. Maria Stein. Maria is the Associate Vice President of Cooperative Education and Career Development at Northeastern University. Um, luckily for us, one of Campus Tap's partner schools. Maria has proven success in higher education in a variety of roles and functions. Um, a major focus of hers is cultivating business partnerships that love leverage college students, both traditional and non-traditional, and graduates in building effective talent pipelines and workforce development strategies. Maria has over 25 years of experience in coaching, consulting, <laughs> teaching, and program development. She's facilitated a variety of workshops and trainings on developing strong experiential education and career development programs and services. Um, very interested in workforce development and succession planning, professional development of students, and building and delivering best-in-class career and cooperative education programs. Under her leadership, Northeastern's cooperative education and career development has earned the Princeton Review's number one ranking five out of the past seven years, um, and her organization has also earned a number one ranking in 2015 from College Magazine, which makes note of the employer engagement opportunities they make available to students. So, thank you so much for being here again, everybody. Um, 
with that said, I'd love to give each of you a chance to speak a little bit more about yourselves and kind of provide a little bit more introduction as well. So since we left off with you, Maria, I'd love to let you kick it off. Sure, I think, I, I mean, you did a great job ca capturing really a, a lot of what I do. On a day-to-day -day basis, really, I ensure that our co-op program um, really does deliver best in class in, in terms of staying on top of what are the trends in the workforce. Um, are we partnering with the right employers, the right industries? Um, do we have the right opportunities with those employers? Are we really maximizing um, our relationships with students for the benefit of our, our employers? Are we getting better at better at helping employers close that skills gap? Do we stay on top of what are the trends coming down the pike in terms of how the world of work is evolving? And, and co-op is really a great vehicle for students and employers to do that, right? It's, it's a test run. Um, many of our employers have said, you know, the, the wonderful thing about co-op is it's a six-month interview while you're getting real work done. So um, I think it is a great model uh, for future training and development. From an employer's perspective, uh, I think for students it is that first-hand access to, tr to trying my career before I spend four years earning a degree and then at the end of it figure out that ooh, this isn't really what I want to do, but I'm also, I also have the opportunity to build the skills that are relevant um, in the world of work and, and really understand why theory is important and how practice really shapes theory and informs uh, and the other way around. Excellent. And with you, you have one of your employer partners in Mora from Liberty Mutual. So Mora, I'll let you speak a little bit more about, you know, maybe some things that you're working on specifically right now and anything you'd like to add. Sure. Um, thanks for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon to most of you. Good morning to some that have joined us from our, from the West Coast. Um, so um, I've been at Liberty Mutual for about 15 years now, and was one of the original um, what we call campus hires um, way back when um, when our program was pretty tiny, um, and we've grown significantly over the last 15 years in this space. Um, where we're up to about 1,800 undergraduate hires annually and about 200 for masters and PhD programs. Um, our recruiting philosophy at Liberty is recruit once, hire twice. So essentially we invest heavily in our interns and in our intern programming um, because when we can recruit them and hire them the first time as an intern and convert them to hire them as a second time, full-time employee, um, there's a lot more ROI and um, and there's a lot uh, more uh, employee engagement and retention in our programs that we've seen um, in, in terms of that strategy. Um, our goal obviously is to deliver best in class recruiting um, to our customers and those customers essentially are our candidates, our, our campuses, so our university partners um, and for us internally our hiring managers because ultimately um, they, they need a win out of this as well. Um, and so um, I guess, you know, today um, a lot of our focus is on continuous improvement. So um, we're always trying to um, improve, um, borrow from others <laughs> ideas that have worked in, in other organizations, um, innovate. Um, so even within um, our campus recruiting team at Liberty, um, we have an innovation squad. Um, where people can submit ideas and we have project teams that work on them to, to bring the, those ideas to life, um, just like a product um, would come to life through an innovation um, session or council, I guess. Um, and then building the really strong partnerships. Um, it's a continuous focus on us, uh, for us with our universities. Great. Thank you, Maura. And lastly, we have Sarah. Uh, Sarah, we'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what you're specifically doing in your role at, at Bullhorn. Sure. Uh, so Bullhorn, we are in a really interesting place within our history. So we've been around since 1999. Um, I joined the organization about three years ago, and we had an employee population in the 300s. Now we are um, around 600. So we've experienced exponential growth within the last few years, and a lot of that has been in the entry level space. So uh, last year, for instance, about 60% of our hires were entry level. So we're kind of in an interesting space. Um, you know, Mora, Liberty Mutual uh, have 
have done a ton in, in terms of building out this really robust, great program. Uh, we're kind of figuring that out still. So we are in a really great place process-wise, talent-wise. The organization is hungry for it. They understand the benefits of entry-level talent. Um, we have a program called our HIPPL program, um, not HIPPO like the animal, but uh, H-P-E-L, high potential entry level. And every single entry level role that we hire is a HIPPL role. And that means you get special mentorship, you are considered someone that, um, also I love the recruit once, hire twice, um, that's what we're looking for is someone that can come in uh, may not have all the skills necessary right now, but we see that they have the potential to to grow and hopefully have a long career at Bullmore. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for all of you being here. We've had the pleasure of working with you all in some different capacities in the past. So, all right, without further ado, let's give um, the people a little bit more of what they came for today. So, um, let's really start things off and kind of just, you know, addressing you know, the state of talent acquisition and just talent in general, you know, as Maria, you're going to be speaking to how to really prepare students for um, for these roles and, and get them into these, um, into these jobs. Um, so the talent landscape has really changed. You know, obviously there is so much talk about the, the millennial impact on the workforce, but, you know, really overall um, priorities for the workforce have changed. Um, the, comp the, the needs of employers and the demands and competency needs have changed um, and there's you know so many different jobs that are available now and also you know that that statistic about you know 60% of the jobs that will exist in five years don't exist now so there's so many different things going on right now that have really shifted the talent landscape so um, starting off first of all with with you Maura and Sarah um, and since we left off with you Sarah I'll kind of let you um, take the first crack at this, but you know we'd love to you know just hear some of your insights on your current talent acquisition best practices um, and how you really you know the different initiatives you have to to attract you know these younger these younger entry level employees. Yeah, so um, it's interesting when I was reading through this question, um, thinking through when when we open a new role, we do a strategy session, figure out what the needs are. Every single position in the organization has some sort of technical need. And that is very, very new and very different than you know 10 years ago, where if you have a finance role, it needs to be someone with a finance background or someone with a finance degree. Now, even if it's a finance role, you need to have a technical acumen because you're using adaptive, you're using concur, you're using different systems. Um, and you need to be able to relate to our clients. Um, who, with us being a software company, are technical people as well. So we are, um, in terms of talent acquisition, looking at how do we best um, how do we best gauge that coming in. We have an assessment that we use to do that, um, but also behavioral interview questions to to figure that out. Um, but in terms of attracting the the millennial um, talent base. Being here in Boston, it's a lot like um, being in California, right? In terms of how do we get people to want to join our companies? We have people offering all sorts of um, crazy benefits. And, you know, we have a cereal bar. We have iced coffee on tap. We have <laughs> these things which are really nice in terms of, uh, you know, having on a flyer at a career fair. But that's not what's really important um, to millennials and to, to people entering the workforce out of college. Um, so I know we'll get into a little bit more in terms of, of retention, but um, we have a number of things that we're looking at beyond just the, the standard benefits package, which will attract the more experienced employee, but um, those coming in right out of college or just entering the workforce have some different things that are going to make them stay. Mm -hmm. and, and now from you, you know, from your side, Maura, um, you know, maybe you can speak to how you're really, really working on recruiting once and hiring twice now with, with these different changes. And maybe you can even speak to possibly um, some of the things you're looking towards as, you know, Gen Z is coming right around the corner now. Oh, you read, you read my mind, Ethan, right? Because um, I think, you know, where we're looking at this and our approach is really understanding that, you know, the students coming out of school today or, or really entering school, um, this new Gen Z, the digital natives, they're just 
ultra savvy, right? Mm -hmm. And so in our organization, we actually, you know, we want to leverage that because it just brings new and fresh ideas mm -hmm. um, as we, again, try to continuously improve and innovate um, in all of the things that we do at Liberty Mutual. And so there is that real benefit. And we start really early. Um, you know, we're on campus um, trying to promote our, our brand, our culture, our people, really through that relationship recruiting experience um, to freshmen and sophomores. And we run a leadership development program to engage them you know, as early as freshman year so that they can come and experience in a three-day externship you know, our Boston headquarters and what it's like to you know, work in claims or work in underwriting or work in our um, finance organization. Um, you know, we're a 50,000-person organization, so we have pretty much every job that you know, any other major um, financial services um, company has. Um, but what we know is what they're learning in the classroom literally today, it, it's going to be different a year from now when they try to apply that to a job. And so that's one of the things that we do and why we work so closely with their universities is so that we have folks um, from Liberty that are actually teaching in the classrooms, um, teaching them what they would actually be doing and, and uh, on a job in the organization. Um, because we find that you know most students aren't necessarily drawn to insurance, um, but when you talk to them about the the types of opportunities we have for essentially every background, right? These transferable skills that students have—they're tech savvy, they're they're business minded, they're adaptable. Um, anyone, even in a liberal arts uh, program, is going to have analytical skills that they're building, um, and so we leverage sort of that marketing aspect. Um, to, to help them understand that um, you know, they can do well in our organization. And as an intern, we're gonna provide them with formal training, um, a network of not only peers, but program managers um, to guide them sort of through their journey. Because um, ultimately, we wanna retain this talent and we wanna convert them. Um, and generally, we find that through these early candidate identification programs and through our internship program and training and development, um, they do want to come join us. They actually will join an insurance company. <laughs> Great. And now, Maria, you have the benefit of having so many of these connections with employers and hearing what they're looking for from these candidates. So obviously, you know, we mentioned in your introduction how, you know, prestigious Northeastern is with the career development and co-op side. So, you know, how do you really take what you're hearing from employers and apply that to the different programs that you have in place? Um, and, and create new ones to really make sure you're um, graduating students and putting them in these opportunities to really be best fits at these companies and um, grow and gain um, a full-time opportunity afterwards. So I think a lot of the, the, the secret to success, if you will, is, is, is really leveraging the, those employer partnerships from day one, right? It's um, partnering with employers to, to provide opportunities for students and employers to engage in transformative and not transactional processes, right? Traditionally, a lot of what we've done on both sides has been very transactional, kind of resumes, inter, you know, sending back and forth, the interview piece, and, and that's good. But before that, you need, really need to think about what does a student need? How does a student understand what it means to work in an insurance company? And, and the best way to do that is to provide opportunities for our students to, to go to Liberty and hear from a variety of different types of professionals at Liberty about what that work looks like and what the skills they might need um, are so that, that as they're thinking about their classes to come back and, and make more informed decisions around that and really think about what does it mean to be a professional? How do I dress like a professional if I'm in an insurance world versus how do I dress for a professional if I am in the high tech space, right? It also means really working creatively and tapping your employers to say, hey, you know what? We're running this new series of workshops or programs and I really think that if you can come and co-present with us. So more of what Maura was saying, kind of the opportunities to bring employers and be engaged in our workshops and, and teaching, not just coming in and doing the traditional info night. So it's things like um, what we are calling Husky Treks, where we take a group of, of freshmen to a company uh, and spend a half a day there learning from the people at that company. It's engaging 
people from our employers organizations to come in and talk to students about what it means to be an underwriter what are the skills how did they get there what do they like what do they dislike um, it's offering them a co-op program so we have a co-op program we work with 3,000 employers plus around the world we have a whole lot going on and and why do we do that right we do that because it helps our students close that skills gap but to do that we have to prepare them so there's a professional uh, development for co-op class that every student has to take and, and really think about what does it mean to be a professional how do I walk into that world and, and be prepared to act appropriately and hit the ground running how do I learn from my colleagues why is networking important how do I network how do I bring back what I've learned in the class in on the co-op and, and really inform what I'm going to do in the classroom and how do I use what I'm learning to make better decisions about what I'm going to do next. And to Maura's point, we're starting younger and younger. We are starting our freshmen from day one. Even before, like during orientation, we're talking about careers and what you need to start thinking about and what are the skills and how, how are some other ways that you can start developing those skills. So not only looking at your curricular, but your co-curricular and how does co-op and other experientials opportunities play into that. It's not only leveraging internships and co-ops, but um, other experiential in instances. So we have with undergrads what we call capstone, and those are projects. How do we use employer, real world projects from our employers in our classrooms to get our students access to more real world so that they're constantly seeing how the world of work is evolving so that they are staying on top of it. So what they're learning today can still be applicable tomorrow. That's fantastic. Um, and now everyone's kind of touched on it a little bit, which is, you know, the next topic we'll get into is, first of all, you know, we touched on how do you acquire and prepare this talent, but how do you really, how do you retain it and get um, employees to stay there? You know, um, I was just recently at the ASU GSV conference in Salt Lake City, and um, so much was talked, was, was spoken about, you um, talent retention and how it's how it's changed and and the, the length of time that people are staying at companies and you know there's so many different opinions and and um, uh, perspectives on that but you know really if you just look at the data job hopping is um, is a trend um, and there's different ways that different employers are are um, approaching it some people think that churn is um, acceptable and there's different and there's uh, ways you can leverage that and work with that um, and that's something we can get into at a different time but um, sticking sticking with you Maria I think it would be interesting to first hear kind of your insight you know having direct contact to students you know what are you seeing from students um, you know in this current time frame and in either previous or um, classes coming up you know what are you seeing from them that maybe leads to their need to kind of Look around, look around, and move from company to company. You know, within their first five to ten years of their career. Sure, I think so. I guess to put it in perspective, so for our from our graduating students, um, we know that fifty percent of them end up with a prior co-op employer that they're getting and accepting probably a, a, a job from a prior co-op employer. We also know, based on studies that uh, companies like ENY have done, that conversion of co-ops and interns. The, the retention is stronger at both the two and five year mark. So we know that co-op and internship programs actually do uh, help in retaining young talent. I think part of some of this job hopping has to do with being a millennial. And if we look at, and, we, and Maura and I were kind of talking about this earlier, the fact that if we look at the millennials, um, they've had parents who lost jobs during that whole dot-com bust and then you know, with the, the, this, uh, the downturn, I don't know what the official term was that we were using for the downturn around 2008, 2009, 2010. So having had parents live through that, that, that has impacted young people's perception of what's going to happen at work. And so I think they're also a generation that have always wanted that recognition and they want that instant gratification. And I think if they work for an organization that really hasn't been very effective in helping them um, get some of that intrinsic need of I need to be recognized and rewarded for my performance they've gone to the next I think the other piece that has perhaps impacted that and, and we'll hear from the employers is the fact that it's very easy for companies these days um, with technology 
um, to identify passive uh, job seekers, if you will, right? So if we look at what's happened through LinkedIn and how easy it is now to identify talent that you might need and lure it away. So I'll, some of it is kind of based on, on what people have lived through. Some of it is a result of technology and I guess in some ways our inability to really make sure that the, um, the talented workforce, um, there's not enough of them to fill all the, the spots available in the workforce. So it's become very easy um, to job hop, if you will, right? And, and you get rewarded for it. Like I can put in 18 to 24 months with an organization and, and one of the competitors will come knocking on my door and offer me more money and a better job title to go work for them. So some of it, it's because of the evolution that we've seen happen. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, Maura, you really focus on hiring a number of those interns that go through um, Delivery Mutual Internship Program. Um, so what do, you, what do you really focus on after you hire them from those programs to keep them engaged? Or maybe what do you do also while they're currently doing those internships to make sure that they'd want to spend a longer amount of time working at Liberty Mutual you know, after they gain that initial employment? Um, and we can speak to the things other than the benefits of, you know, um, technically the benefits that go along with the startup, you know, the startup yeah. side of things, you know, the Silicon Valley side of things. You don't think insurance is as fun as that, <laughs> Ethan? Oh, no. <laughs> that, I'm, that alone I'm keeps them in the building the right now. Real tangible opportunities, yes. Yeah. No, you know, it's funny. When I was thinking about this, um, you know, five years ago, I would have been out there recruiting students, um, telling them that, you know, insurance, it's a stable industry, right? You're always going to have a job. Okay, well, no, it is it is completely dynamic, and it is so fast-paced, and it is ever-changing and evolving, um, because, I mean, quite frankly, we have to keep up with the pace of change. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, or I guess most importantly, through our intern programs, and then essentially most of them lead to um, full-time development programs, we're investing so much in these students for training, development, um, so that they don't leave. Um, and, you know, the really great thing about Liberty, um, and, and a lot of other large organizations specifically, is that um, there are so many opportunities available and when you're coming out of one of these leadership programs or our entry-level programs you're very well networked and you're very well developed in that functional area um, but we've also continued to improve on your transferable skills and so there are so many opportunities for um, individuals to move across functions across departments you don't always have to go um, directly upward right there's a lot of lateral movement at Liberty um, which makes your job sort of, you know, just as dynamic as what other people are, are doing in, in the organization. Um, and so it, it really keeps you challenged. And that's certainly what we try to do to retain our employees. Um, but we do know that over the years, um, we've had to make some adjustments for the employee engagement piece. And we've come leaps and bounds in that space. Even today, I've we were waiting, we were waiting. Um, we got the note, we are now a completely casual work environment, meaning I get to wear jeans to work. At two years ago, I was still wearing a suit every day, right? So <laughs> big improvements. And those, those are a lot of the things that millennials or you know, these um, new hires are looking for in an organization. Um, and that's, you know, work is certainly the most important. Their learning and development is the most important. We have a tremendous network of employee resource groups that are available to students, um, as well as, you know, our full-time employees, um, that they can participate in, in tons of different events. Um, and so I think those are some of the things that we've been doing, um, especially with the focus on the work and the challenging and the fun and exciting work um, to keep people engaged and you know um, our retention levels are tremendous at the intern and, um, and entry level um, hire uh, as a source of hires and we have those metrics to show that um, you know so the good news is we actually don't see as much job hopping as I think a lot of the external benchmarks predict a report excellent. on. Um, yeah. That's excellent. Um, and now now moving on to you, Sarah. Um, as Bullhorn is a much you know younger company, 
um, not in terms of the age and demographics, but it's only been around since 1999, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've also written about how dynamic and great the culture is at Bullhorn. So maybe you can speak to more about the importance of establishing that culture um, and what you do to really kind of continuously update it so that you're meeting, you know, um, the, the feedback that, you know, you're getting from different employees. Definitely. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it is similar to larger organizations in terms of the people who have started with us early in their career or started right out of school. Those are the ones that do stay with us longer. And that has been a huge benefit. Um, although of course, yes, our tenure is much longer. We had two people last year hit the 15 year mark with us. Um, our CEO got them both BMW leases. So that was one that I know is not um, something that we can replicate everywhere or will be able to do in five years when more people hit that mark. But anyway, there's a, it's very different. Um, but we also, um, yeah, like Maria brought up this, the, the new employee that's coming in is one that's been used to constant upgrades. You know, I can I can upgrade my phone every six months. Why do I have to wait a year before I get a promotion? So we we try to stay very close to what it is that is keeping employees happy already, and what we can do to um, to keep them happy moving forward. So we about a year ago started conducting stay interviews. Um, most companies do exit interviews when people leave. So we are doing stay interviews to figure out why people are staying, what will make them stay with us. Um, so we've gotten a lot of great pieces out of that. And a few that have come about are um, the importance of really connecting to the mission of the company. And so um, more you bring up Liberty Mutual and insurance, and maybe that's not something that intrinsically people are feeling I'm saving the world or I'm really connected to. Um, Same with us. You know, we do software that's used primarily by the staffing industry. So just stating it that way, um, there might not be a lot of pride in terms of the, you know, what I'm doing is making a big impact on the world. So we've done a few things there to, to really help people feel connected and that is making them stay longer. So um, for instance, we changed our mission a few years ago to, um, to creating an incredible customer experience, which is, um, seems very simple, but we can really tie that to the career cycle. So you create an incredible experience that adds to um, more growth of the company, which leads to more career growth opportunities, and it just goes around. So we've done that. Um, we also have Bullhorn Cares, which is our philanthropic group. And that's one that really allows um, our employees to, to not only get involved together and collectively making a difference in the, the different offices we have around the globe, um, but also gives them an opportunity to bring forth causes that are important to them personally and allow others to um, make an impact there too. So that's a big area that we've seen a lot of um, retention around is that that connection to the company, to what we do and knowing that we do make a positive impact on um, the communities that we are in. Excellent. And now moving, moving from, uh, from that, you know, another big, Another big issue uh, is, is the skills gap right now, you know, and, and skills that are needed, especially tech, technical skills, are, are really always changing and adapting um, in every industry now. Um, no matter what kind of company that there is, there's a heavy emphasis on developers um, and the data analytics side. So technical skills are certainly something that's much more in demand now. Um, so with that said, um, and kind of sticking with Maura and Sarah to kind of kick things off here first, um, you know, really how have you both seen um, this need from your companies and what your companies does change um, over the past few years? Maybe we can start this one off with you, Maura, since um, the insurance agency, you know, like you said, it seemed like something that's very stable, but now it's becoming much more dynamic and um, love to hear how you've experienced that change um, in your in your tenure at Liberty Mutual and um, some of the things that you are doing internally um, to make sure that you're able to provide that training to um, employees while they're while they're working there. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, over the past couple of years now, we've seen um, a, a huge shift. Three years ago, I was in a meeting um, with a group of our CIOs and they were talking about their IT 2020, right? Sort of their roadmap to 2020. Six months after that conversation, it got thrown out and now there's an IT manifesto that basically changes <laughs> every six months, right? In the organization, across the organization. Um, we've moved to a completely agile environment at Liberty. And so no longer am I handed a hire plan for 300 IT analysts. It's now a hire plan for 300 um, folks to go into our Tech Start at Liberty program and they're all computer science majors. So the focus is heavily technical now. Um, we need software developers and we need those um, cybersecurity folks, um, most specifically in our organization. So that's been a huge shift. Um, but it allows us, um, it, and be, because of the technology and the innovation and the way that work is done at Liberty now, it allows us to talk about it um, in a much cooler way, I guess, um, to students on campus, right? So we have these examples. You know, um, you can ask Alexa a question and sometimes she may say, um, sorry, I don't know the answer to that, right? Well. When someone asked Alexa the first question around insurance and insurance products, she didn't know the answer. So Liberty Mutual partnered with Amazon and we built that skill set for Alexa, right? And those are students um, that have joined as entry level hires that are part of those innovation teams, um, you know, these, these 12 week um, scrums, right, that um, participate in activities like that that really move um, our organization forward. And so, that's um, the really neat thing. The other thing, even that you just mentioned, was you know how do we continue to grow the talent internally and develop them? So we knew that there was going to be a large population of talent that were in less technical roles, more business analyst type roles. And what do we do for those individuals that don't really have the skill that we need anymore? Well, we started a go for code program. So internal um, uh, Liberty Mutual employees can join this development, internal development program so they can grow the skills necessary to continue to be successful in the organization, um, which I think is pretty amazing, right, that we can do that internally and that we've thought to do that internally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and now, Sarah, um, maybe one thing definitely we could get from you is, you know, what are some of those core technical skills right now that you see that are most in demand? You know, I mean, it's obviously constantly changing, but um, mm -hmm. when you're looking at for um, potential candidates for specific roles, what are the skills in, you know, and maybe you can speak to different positions or a little bit more mm -hmm. broadly, either one, um, but what are those skills right now that are really in demand that you're looking for technically? Yeah, definitely. So uh, it is it is changing, and um, at each company probably dependent on the technology that that they have. So um, you know, we look for our specific tech stack, which also does change as well. Um, but like Maura mentioned, we are in agile development as well. So we do monthly releases. Um, so two two week dev sprints, one week testing sprint, we release. So being able to keep up with that fast pace. Um, being able to be not what I think the stereotypical or traditional computer programmer has been, which is, you know, you're behind your computer typing, you have to be able to work on a scrum team. You have to be able to collaborate. Um, for us across the globe sometimes, you have to be in, in Slack video me meetings with people on your scrum team in St. Louis. Um, so those skills coupled with the technical skills that's that's tough that that can be tough to find sometimes so we um we also have been doing things internally to give an opportunity for people that uh, maybe are BAs or PMs or um, you know one of our tech ops engineers that want to be a developer um, that have those great skills, those great um, cross departmental skills or um, interpersonal skills to be able to to get those technical pieces. Um, so we we partner with the community a lot. Um, we had. Um, 
last night actually we had a uh, girl develop it was on site we hosted them for a um, ux class and we sent some bullhorn employees there um, we bring a professor on site um, for a few days once a quarter and do an intro to java class for anyone that wants to attend um, we have an innovation week as well, once a quarter, where um, people could come up with new ideas for our software um, and then present it to the CTO and other members of the leadership team um, that really gets them excited about the technology and, and kind of forces them to, to take a look at how we can be thinking about it differently or how we can um, be using it differently. We um, sales duel is one that came out last year, which is kind of like a fantasy football platform, but for different sales activities for our users, which um, that came out of innovation week and we see our clients using it. So um, everyone gets behind that and really excited about it. And it just, um, it, it entices people to, to keep growing those skills as well. Excellent. And now Maria, I had the pleasure of attending your um, employer partner conference last week. We learned a great deal about what you're doing at Northeastern and the different programs that you're adding um, to really kind of close that skills gap. And not only, so I'll let you speak to it instead of instead of myself speaking to it for you. Um, but yeah, so what are some of the different programs that you're adding and the different initiatives you're working on right now to really emphasize those technical skills within students' educations and the experiences that they're getting, getting during their time at Northeastern? Sure, so um, I think, you know, you heard from our keynote speaker in the morning, um, Sean Gallagher, who's, who's really looking at kind of that intersection. So that's a new initiative on our campus. That, that center um, was recently announced. I, it was announced over the, um, the winter time here on our campus. So, so that's one way we're looking at um, how do we really find those synergies between the employers and, and the college campuses to ensure that we're, we're moving in the same direction, that we're ensuring that um, we have the right credentials that we're, we're educating to the skill sets. Um, I think uh, another great uh, initiative that has been uh, going on for over five years is Northeastern has invented, uh, invested in our graduate campus network. And so um, we're going into regions like Charlotte, Seattle, Silicon Valley. We've just opened up in Toronto to really look at what are the skills that are driving the growth um, in industries in those regions. Where, where's the gap? And really partnering to develop a master's program, certificate programs, other programs that people in that region can take advantage of and companies can partner with us to deliver so that they are upskilling, right skilling uh, their existing employee base, but also for, for folks in that region who feel like, God, I can be doing something better. Mm -hmm. They also can t can tap into that. Um, we have this program called Level, which was one of the options uh, available at uh, the conference last week. I think that was last week. Uh, w w these are boot camp uh, mm -hmm. opportunities, so uh, around data analytics, uh, cybersecurity kinds of things. We have uh, we're, we're really being more. Um, intentional about embedding experiential um, throughout everything that we do. So embedding experiential projects in, in our coursework, uh, being more flexible in the types of uh, internship and co-ops that our students and our employer partners can tap into. Not everybody needs a six week, not every learner can afford, I mean a six month and not every learner has uh, the ability to take off if they're working full time and do a six month co-op. Uh, we're really looking at masters and PhDs, like the, those traditional programs and, and developing experiential programs and partnering with employers to develop experiential programs there. Looking at what are the skills. Uh, our keynote speaker at lunch was our, the dean of our computer science college and she talked about how she's partnering with all the other colleges to create meaningful minors. And, and that's important, right? What is a meaningful minor? What is the relevance of giving every student the opportunity to have a computer science minor to understand um, that tech piece and really apply it? And if we think about the skills for, for forever that I've been hearing employers really want beyond the tech skills, like every job, it's the communication skills, the critical thinking, the problem solving, the teamwork, the leadership. And we, two years ago, we commissioned a study and sh that showed that co-op actually does close the skills gap in, in those. And really working more intentional with students to help them really think about how are they growing their skills? What skills and competencies are they lacking and, and what can they do, right? So, so creating um, a, a way for them to really start thinking about 
where do I need growth in my competencies and skills and what are the ways that I can really grow those skills and being more intentional about how they're really leveraging all opportunities around, along the experiential spectrum. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh, and GE, we partnered yeah. with GE for yes. that equip thing. I totally forgot about that, but that's important. So <laughs> that's that, that um, so GE has uh, factory workers, uh, that, that the, the manufacturing kinds of uh, folks, I shouldn't say factory workers, manufacturing workers, and that whole process really using um, AI and technology to streamline that process. But then you really have to think about that workforce. How do you upskill and right skill and invest in that workforce so that they're continuing to grow and evolve as the nature of how we do the work grows and evolves? Yeah, that was particularly interesting too because I actually sat in on that um, on that on that presentation, and it, that was particularly interesting because it was something we were not talking about just current students and the next kind of generation of the workforce. We were really talking about current generations and you know the older, more established um, workforce base and how you really provide skills to them so that they can reskill themselves, like you mentioned, um, and adapt and incorporate technology into their roles when they're so used to doing so many things. Um, manually without the aid of technology so that was um, particularly interesting and um, really enjoyed that part and I think it's great to to, to really emphasize that there are different programs um, and initiatives and um, collaborations out there that aren't just necessarily focusing on the younger um, the younger sorry just the younger workforce the traditional college age yeah. yeah yeah I feel like there's so much focused on just that aspect but it's really great to know that you know Northeastern, which is a college, is working with GE to really help you know their other employees, not just not just the the new ones and the entry level people coming in. Um, now, as I'm noticing, we're getting a little bit shorter on time, and we have some questions coming in. I definitely want to make sure I leave some time for those. Um, so, again, if anybody does have any other questions as we're kind of coming to the conclusion here, um, please feel free to pop those into the chat window, and we will um, try to get to as many of them as possible um, as we finish up. Um, so looking at the last couple of kind of questions I had here on the agenda, uh, I think I'm going to kind of call a little bit of an audible and mix things up a little bit here. So we kind of lastly wanted to focus on, you know, the employer, the employer partnerships, you know, how you build those, but also experiential learning, internship and co-op programs. Um, and what's great is we kind of have all different um, levels and perspectives, especially on the internship program side. Um, so I'd first like to start, um, with you, Sarah, you know, I know you just mentioned you're going to be kicking off um, Bullhorn's like inaugural internship program um, in just a few weeks. You mentioned, mm -hmm. so we'd love love to learn about you know really what what you did to to develop that, the things that you yeah. looked at to make sure that you're creating a program that to start off is going to be most beneficial, um, mm -hmm. and maybe speak to any you know any sourcing that you did. Um, basically, just kind of how you're how you're expecting that to go and what you did to really get that up and running. Yeah, so um, yes, it definitely in its infancy, but I will share um, what our, our goals are and, and what we did to, to get ready. So um, we have our inaugural summer intern class um, starting with us on June 5th. And it's uh, just 10 individuals in our Boston office, so we're starting out small. Um, what was important to us, we, we've had ad hoc interns um, at various points in time and haven't, um, as a talent team, really been able to, to keep track of, you know, are they really getting the full benefits of an intern program as we know it can be. So this program, um, every single one that comes in will have a project that they work on that they have to complete throughout the summer. Um, and that's something that we want them to determine. So they have a deadline to determine what their project is, um, of course, with the help of their manager, but that they've come in and identified what that is. Um, and then throughout the program, we have a um, every week something for um, some sort of professional development session for them. Um, we have an executive lunch with all our C-levels, so they get a, a chance to do that. So. With a small group, we're starting small in terms of our initiatives, but um, we have a mix. We have some sophomores, some juniors. Um, I don't think we have any freshmen this go around, but individuals that we hope will return again next summer or that we'll be able to um, make full-time employment offers at the end of the summer. Excellent. And um, now moving from that to a program that's been a little bit more established. Uh, Maura, uh, we'd love to hear about you know how your internship program 
not only has evolved, but really the mission that it's rooted in, um, and what the what the focuses are to make that so successful, so they can really feel comfortable hiring those interns uh, for unemployment moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sarah, I can certainly say it takes time. This didn't happen <laughs> overnight for us. Um, so back when I started the program, it was actually, so the, the, the position didn't exist, so that's pretty cool, right? Because I convinced the, the right people that we needed this in our organization. This was back in 2007. Um, and we knew that there were pockets of interns across the country, um, but there was absolutely nothing formal, right? So I had to take this and sort of figure it out um, from, like you said, these ad hoc interns. Um, so essentially, we centralized, we organized, we educated um, internally so that we could sort of deliver a program to students that were coming in. And it was a holistic, enterprise wide, country wide um, initiative. So over the years, um, we've adapted and developed and evolved. Um, but essentially, we got to a place where we have, um, you know, formal, um, a, a formal training program for managers as well as students um, that are coming on board, um, heavily focused on uh, professional development for students, um, educational uh, and technical development within you know the, the group that they work in, as well as those social um, and networking events. So again, on a, on a um, weekly basis, there is at least one touch point from my programming team. Um, which is made up of about seven individuals with one intern program manager. Um, and so, again, it really is that relationship building piece that we stay connected to the interns that has made us so successful. But it doesn't stop at the end of the 12 weeks. We have a LMI um, Campus Connections program, which essentially then um, continues um, the touch points with students and the supervisors or the managers of those interns when they're back on campus so they don't forget about us because that's how we work to retain them. Um, so we deliver programming when they're on campus through a peer connections um, event where we'll host um, anyone who has worked at Liberty um, or has a job offer or an accepted offer. We send our alumni back on campus to host events for them um, so they can stay connected to the um, to the network that they've already built. Um, and then we also have, you know, a LinkedIn group that they can stay a part of, an opt-in newsletter. Um, we do send gifts during the exam <laughs> period um, because, you know, it's always nice to get a little care package. Um, you know, so it is some of those things. But I think the, the, the biggest success we've had is preparing our managers, educating our managers, and then having the core capabilities and the actual objectives defined for every intern and knowing that our talent management practice, they actually make sure that the managers are submitting um, the objectives through our system, just like any traditional employee, and they are providing that sort of um, midsummer and final review for the intern as well. Excellent. Um, and now, Maria, we could we could go on and on and on about how you know advanced and constantly adapting and successful the Northeastern's co-op program is. Um, so we'd love 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 to hear you know how you're constantly um, making sure that that is kind of on the cutting edge of preparing students for their careers um, and career development. You know, and also, you know, speak for what you're not only looking for in employers that are sending these students um, on these co-ops to, but also we'd love to hear, you know, kind of the expectations from Northeastern um, that the employers are seeking when they're actually bringing these students in and maybe how that's helped um, develop the co-op program at Northeastern. Sure. So, I mean, we've been fortunate in that, in that we've been in the co-op business for over 100 years, right? Um, and, and we've continually evolved co-op as Northeastern has grown and evolved. So um, I always tell people, you know, co-op at Northeastern began as an earn to learn program. So we began uh, over 100 years ago in our College of Engineering with four students and four employers working week on, earning enough to pay for courses. Um, and, and that evolved into quarters and then it evolved into six month period of time. And, and really it evolved into six months because of our employers, right? We, we, we're constantly looking for feedback from our employers and our employees, 
employers consistently came back and said, look, we love co-op, but three months isn't enough. It takes us six to eight weeks to train them, and then it doesn't leave us enough time to get that return on our investment. So we heard, and we changed to six-month co-ops, and, and students got to do real work, meaningful work, right? And, and, and the, the key is students want to do meaningful work. They don't want to do busy work. Yes, every student has to understand that it's a progression, but we also don't want our students fetching coffee. So we really try to get our know our employers really, really well. We, we try to understand the nature of the work, and we're honest. We'll say, look, this job description isn't going to resonate. If you really want that type of student, here are some things you have to build into that job, right? So we are constantly, we always uh, get feedback from our employers. So at the end of every co-op, for every student, employers fill out an evaluation. They also are filling out an evaluation on our process. Um, we, students evaluate our employers. So we gather all that information and use that, right? We also want to hear from our students. What companies do they want to work for? We're, and we look at labor market information, what industries are go, growing in what regions, and then we build our, our target list. But then we go back to our existing partners and say, hey, where's your growth? Where are your pain points? How can we help? Can co-op help you? Uh, Liberty Mutual, even though they're down the street, did not have a formal co-op program for years, right? Yeah. But we were, we were persistent with kind of going back to Liberty. They would hire co-op here and there. And so part of that is understanding that it takes time, right? You, you don't go from zero uh, to 160 overnight. And, and so part of that is listening to what your employer partner needs and saying, okay, you know what, yes, we, we, we would love a six-month co-op, but you can't do that. Well, how do we leverage your internship program, or how do we help you think about developing this in ways that are manageable for your organization? Perhaps you might want to start with hiring full-time. So really looking at what our partner's pain points are and, and helping them think about our range of experiential options and how we might help them leverage those um, and really think about expanding our relationship. Liberty started out with a, a handful of positions, and I think we hired 66 from Northeastern this year. Wow. And, yeah. and it speaks for itself, right? So, so the program, I think, actually sells itself through managers, but it means that, to Morris' point, you, you partner. They're, they're investing in training their managers to understand what that young person is looking for because it is an investment. It is that interview once and hire twice, and if you understand that and we work at it together, at the end of the day, we are working towards the same goal. We want the best fit for our students so that they can have a meaningful, lifelong career that they experience lifelong career sex, success through. And you do that by really understanding the real the world of work and your employer partners. Excellent. Um, that was a great way to really wrap things up, Maria. Um, now we have a couple questions who have come in. Um, so uh, I'm going to just pull those to the general panel and, and let anyone attack those as they see fit. Um, as we have a few minutes left, if anybody does have any last minute questions, feel free to do that right now. Otherwise, we will be um, closing things out very shortly. Um, so first of all, we had, um, and this is kind of a question anyone can speak to, really how do employers you know, navigate um, the campus to, to, to get themselves into the classrooms um, and speaking to students more, um, more, more directly. So, uh, you know, from, from the college perspective, working through your career center is probably the best way to do that. And oftentimes the reality is getting in front of academic classes is really, really hard. Um, only because our academic faculty do have a lot of content that, that they need to deliver. So part of that is, is really understanding the curriculum and then picking a topic that's in that curriculum that your organization has expertise in and, and planning ahead, right? You, you don't go to that faculty that semester. You probably want to start the conversa conversation a good year before so that you get to see that professor's curriculum, really understand where your expertise is and how that faculty can leverage it to bring a different perspective to the table. Excellent. And now, capstone Sarah. courses. Yes. Invest in capstone courses. Okay. Or, and we have other ways for experiential that aren't capstone as well. Okay. Excellent. Um, and the last question, I think this one's directly for, for you, Maria. Um, is your co-op program for academic credit? No. So um, it's not required. 
Uh, it's not mandatory and it's not for academic credit. Our students do not pay a fee for co-op. Now, I just said our, it's not required and it's not for academic credit. That said, we have 10,000 students a year that complete a co-op. 95% of our undergraduate class will participate in at least one and 79% will do two to three co-ops. Excellent, excellent. Um, anybody have anything to add um, from the panel before we close things out this afternoon? I'll just say um, from an employer perspective, not to be afraid to reach out if you work at a college. Um, that's a lot, all of our partnerships have grown organically that way. And even if it's not local, um, our CFO did a um, finance for the software industry webinar for Johns Hopkins master's program recently. And that's just because their um, career services reached out to me and said, is there anyone in your org that would do that? And um, and that's great for us too. That's a win for us because it gets our CFO more engaged in, in what we do from a talent perspective. Um, so don't be afraid to, to reach out. Um, we're all really busy, all of us I know, but um, especially on the employer side and and when new ideas come to us it's helpful excellent excellent um, well thank you so much to you Sarah and um, both of you Maura and Maria um, over there at Northeastern um, really really appreciated having the three of you here today this I think was one of our most beneficial webinars we've done to date and I would love to have um, any of you involved in some more moving forward so definitely um, keep that in mind and like Sarah mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out to me as well for anything. Um, we will be following up with everyone who joined today and everyone who registered with a link to see this so you can see it in perpetuity anytime, um, anywhere. Um, and feel free to share, feel free to share with anybody who you think would really enjoy this. Um, so that is all for today. Again, if you have questions or anything or any insight into seeing more from Campus Tap, um, you can reach me directly. It's just Ethan at thecampustap.com. Um, and we'll follow up with all of this uh, information as well when we send everyone the link to, um, to view the webinar following today's live event. So thank you again to everyone who attended um, and most importantly to our panelists. And we will speak to all of you soon.